I often hear people on the left blaming capitalism for women's oppression. But the origins of women's oppression is not in capitalism. Its roots go back much, much further back in time. They originate in early forms of class differentiation of society. It emerges with the, with the emergence of private property. And that goes back thousands of years. It's a very long time, which has allowed the ideas to be embedded in human consciousness. The idea that it's always been like this. Even many women accept this is how it is because they accept what their mothers, their grandmothers, their great grandma, it's always been like this as far as we can remember. But this is breaking down as an idea. And it's breaking down as a consequence of the development of society and thanks to class struggle itself. And the revolution is what will finally remove this idea uh, from the consciousness of humanity. Now, capitalism didn't create the, um, the idea of the family and the idea of the man dominating the woman. It has inherited it from previous societies, but it finds it a very useful tool. It's useful for dividing the working class and for mobilizing backward layers in moments of um, class struggle. Capitalism, however, also lays the basis for women's liberation. In what sense? Through the development of the productive forces, by bringing women into production itself. So it's through capitalism that we see the basis that is created for the final overthrow of this form of, of, uh, of the family. And true liberation will come through a radical transformation of society. When I, when I said the idea that things have always been like this, that always actually proves to be a very short period of history. If we consider that Homo sapiens, the latest findings seem to indicate that we have been around for about 300,000 years, and maybe 10 or 12,000 of those years, we had some form of class society. So from the long historical view, it's a very short period. But of course, in the minds of individuals, it's a very long period. But as Marxists, we look at the long view of history. We look at the process over long periods of time. Now, we've had different forms of class society, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, different forms, but all of them have something in common, a property class at the top. In the passage from each of these, we've seen radical changes. Now, when the bourgeoisie was coming to power, it required the most advanced thinking of its time. That's why the, the bourgeoisie in its early period had a rational scientific approach to questions. They wanted the idea of revolutionary change the most advanced elements anyway. But once it consolidated its position in power to defend the privileges it now had, it needed to abandon its earlier ideas, ideas that evoked social change. Now it was social conservatism. And there was, there was even a reaction against the very same ideas the bourgeoisie espoused as it came to power. Now on the family, we see something similar. We had people like Morgan, who wrote his book, um, Ancient Society, that Engels used to develop his text on the origins of the family. Now, Morgan is a product of the uh, 19th century. And of course, much more research has been done since. Um, we don't regard Morgan as the Bible of anthropology. Some of the things he said are dated and have been, uh, have been we passed beyond. But he represented an, a, a major step forward in our understanding. In the same way, Darwin developed the theory of evolution. It was later sharpened, for example, with the idea of punctuated equilibrium, i.e. that evolution takes place through, in, in geological time anyway, uh, leaps. Now, because some of what Darwin uh, said proved to be not, not exact, doesn't mean that we throw evolution out as a theory, unless you're a, you're a US Republican or, or, or you're called Donald Trump.
Um, but let us look at Morgan. Now I'm going to take it for granted that you have either already read Engels' book on the origins of the family, or you're going to read it after this Marxist university. But I wanted to, to outline the origins, wh wh where Engels took a lot of his ideas, where he, where he took it from. Now, Morgan was a bourgeois, a Republican. Remember, in those days, the Republicans were not the Republicans of today. Things have flipped in American politics, we know that. The Republicans were the more progressive wing, let's, let's say. He, he studied kinship systems in several uh, peoples. He traveled to Europe. He met Darwin and, other, and, and um, some um, British anthropologists. He developed his theory of uh, social evolution, i.e. that society develops, it evolves. And the different societies have gone through similar stages of development. For instance, he came to the conclusion that humanity had a common origin, something which now is taken for granted as an idea. Now, he, he thought that that common origin was in Asia. Now, it, 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 it seems confirmed that it was, it was in Africa. This is an indication of the period he was writing in, obviously. But he underlined the fact that the technological progress determined changes in society. He sees similarities in developments in different societies. He, he saw in the different societies that, that uh, existed in different parts of the world, he saw a, this is as allowing us to have a picture of development, um, a picture which obviously develops over tens of thousands of years. Just a little warning on the use of terminology. Morgan used terms which we wouldn't use today. He used savagery, barbarism, and civilization. So we should be careful in not seeing into the use of these words, meanings which we would give to those words today. He also uses the word communism and communist at least nine, ten times in the book. Somebody reading that today might think he was referring to Stalinism. Of course, that was impossible in the 1870s. What he meant was people lived in a communist way. There was no property and there were no classes. Now, if you have an evolutionary approach, you will see development and change. You don't see merely cultural differences. Well, of course, there are cult different cultures, but the structure or of the family, um, if you present it as a cultural thing, it means, well, in that particular society, it's always been like this. And in, the, in this other culture, it's like this. And also, it's always been like this. But we know, for example, that in Europe, a thousand years ago, 2,000 years, things were different because we have the historical knowledge of the changes that took place. The Romans had slaves. So it, is it a cultural characteristic of Romans to have slaves? Well, the Romans of today don't have slaves. So where, would, where did the change come from? There was a change in society. And the development of the productive forces is what is the engine, is the motor that drives the change. Even within the Americas, yesterday we had a discussion on the Spanish conquest. You have peoples at different levels, from hunter-gatherers to people living in cities. Um, and it was pushed by the development of technique. Now, nowadays, we wouldn't use the terms Morgan uses, but we use words such as Paleolithic, that is the old Stone Age, Neolithic, which is the final stage, of, of the Stone Age, and then we have the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. Um, of course, and th of course, the timeline of these stages are not the same in every part of the world. Development took place at different paces in different parts of the world. And that has nothing to do with any idea of a superior race, as some people uh, in the past would claim. It can depend on the geographic conditions, the climatic conditions, the animals that are available, the material resources that are available. Humans are all equally intelligent. The difference is simply an accumulation of knowledge over time. Now, Morgan pointed out that just as society changed, so did the family.
Now, Europeans, when they started to colonize other parts of the world, they had known the monogamian family, i.e. man-woman relationship fixed for life, with the, with the father figure dominating. This, this idea they had as far, as, as far back as they could remember. And descent was through the male line. Yeah, let's, not, let's, let's not confuse patrilineal and patriarchal. And not confuse matrilineal with matriarchal. Because matriarchy gives the idea that women dominated. That's not what we're talking about. We had matrilineal uh, lineage, i.e. descent traced through the women's line. But with monog monogamy comes um, strict faithfulness, i.e. fidelity, in theory of both sides, in practice of the woman. Now, when the Europeans embarked on colonizing, um, they encountered many different peoples in different parts of the world, and they did not understand what they were seeing. They could not understand the family relations. For instance, they would see a chief, and they would think, that's their king. They didn't understand the idea of common ownership of the land. So they saw feudalism, where there was no feudalism, and the family bewildered them. In some cases, they just saw promiscuity, the, 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 these relations which were immoral. Morgan actually makes the point that the mistakes were made by viewing these societies through the lens of Europeans. You know, the family in, uh, in, in, in European societies didn't emerge ready-made. It wasn't the product of Adam and Eve. Mom, you know, mum and dad who have the kids. You know, the first nuclear family, Adam and Eve. Um, so they couldn't understand. And the problems uh, in a lot of the accounts of the Europeans is that they were describing something they couldn't really understand the structure that lay behind it. Now, throughout Morgan's book, you find an idea that property is actually the base for the transformation of the family into what we have today. But he also stresses that there were different forms of the family. Now, at some point, human beings realized or discovered, we, nobody can say exactly how, that it was better to avoid consanguine reproduction. At a certain point, the family structure was based on the prohibition of reproduction within your own group, i.e. within your own gens, as they called it. I have an article here from Cambridge University. This article is uh, from 2017. And the title of the article is Prehistoric Humans Are Likely to Have Formed Mating Networks to Avoid Inbreeding. It says that at least 34,000 years ago, according to this research, when I was reading this, I thought this, this seems to correspond to what Morgan was saying. Now, um, what, were, what are the common elements of primitive societies? Sorry if I use the word primitive. In my mind, it means it comes from the word, you know, primus, first, the early societies. It's not a derogative term. In those societies, there's no property, no classes. You had a, a, a communism in the way they lived, i.e., they, they shared everything out. And they were egalitarian. Again, I, have, I can quote them later. Lots of research on hunter-gatherers today, even where it's demonstrated there's equality between all the members, men and women. Now, um, one, of the, one of the points that Morgan underlines is the fact that in these early conditions, the father was unknown. That explains why the lineage was through the woman. You knew who your mother was. You did not necessarily know who your father was. Um, and therefore, the group was formed around the women. Does that mean that men had no role? Of course they did. But something that Morgan highlights is also, you knew who your uncle was on your mother's side, but you didn't necessarily know who your father was. There are cases where, uh, when, when inheritance began in the early stages, it would, go from, it would go from the uncle to the nephew. I've got to jump because of time. But Morgan noticed 
from his studies and from reading accounts of others that this kind of structure, i.e. the gens and the and mating outside the gens with another gens, he found, he found that it existed in various parts of the world, which would indicate that it went very far back in time. That article I just quoted from Cambridge University shows that they think at least, at least 34,000 years ago, this was already the case. He finds traces of it even in ancient Greek and Roman society. And he finds this historical passage in many different parts of the world from a matrilineal to a patrilineal society. Now, in, when, when the early forms of property emerged, which was held in common by the gens, that meant everything that, the, the land that was held in common by the gens remained within the gens. So property was passed through the mother uh, line, but it wasn't private property yet. It was common. But eventually, gradually, uh, individual property started to emerge here and there. Now, when th this, this forced a switch in the way the gens was structured. In the early forms, the man would leave his gens and go to the woman's gens and mate, reproduce. And there was no fixed relationship. There was no uh, document saying you're married for life. The, the couple could, the, could, uh, could separate. There was no guarantee that the, the children came from this or that man. But as property developed, and especially considering that the early forms of property were domesticated animals, this new phenomenon, wealth, I want to quote, domestic, the domestic animals were a possession of greater value than all kinds of property previously known put together. They served for food, were exchangeable for other commodities, were usable for rede redeeming captives, for paying fines, and in sacrifices in the observance of their religious rites. Moreover, as they were capable of indefinite multiplication in numbers, their possession revealed to the human mind its first conception of wealth. Following upon this, in the course of time, was the systematic cultivation of the earth, which tended to identify the family with the soil and render it a property-making organization. Now, this emergence of a new phenomenon, wealth, the accumulation of wealth, introduced this the desire to pass on this wealth to the next generation. And that meant the men who had the herds, who had the animals, desired to pass this on to their offspring. This is what produced the first switch, which was no longer the men traveling to the woman's gens to reproduce, but the women now being taken out of their communities into the men's gens. This was a passage which dramatically changed the position of women in society. Previous to this, Morgan explains that they, they lived, um, they practiced communism in living. Society was ruled through councils that were elected. And in the assemblies, everyone, male or female, could express their views. I counted it, actually. Um, Morgan uses the word communism nine times in his book. Now, he wasn't a, a communist uh, at all, um, but he was, he was just observing how these societies were structured. And then he, he refers to the, um, the unfavorable influence on women that property had. Um, and with this, eventually emerged the monogamian family. Now, he explains that the monogamy is where there's a strict discipline, i.e. they're married and it's for life. Before that, there was the pairing relationship, i.e. men and women related, became couples, but not fixed for life. They were free to separate. Now, Morgan encountered in his studies different stages of development. 
He sees matrilineal societies. He records some of the older generation remembering the, the elements of the matrilineal that they remembered, but had already either disappeared or they were transitioning. And Morgan also explains how the state emerges on the basis of property. And I'll quote, the growth of the idea of property and the rise of monogamy furnished motives sufficiently powerful to demand and obtain this change in order to bring children into the gens of their father and into a participation in the inheritance of his estate. Monogamy assured the paternity of children, which was unknown when the gens was instituted. He says, the idea of the family has been a growth through successive stages of development, the monogamian being the last in its series of forms. He also looks at the way the state emerged in ancient Greece. He quotes the case of Solon, who, who developed the idea of four classes uh, based on uh, their wealth. In ancient Rome, he quotes the example of Servius, who divided society into five classes based on the value of their property. And then Dionysius, who came along and added a sixth class, the propertyless. And now Morgan refers to the, quote, men of property. And these became a power in government. And with this idea of property also came slavery, the idea that you could actually own another human being. And you could own your wife and your children. And the, the prime example of that is um, the pater familias in Roman society, where the father had absolute power over all the members of the family. Yeah. Um, quote number 14 for the translators. Man, far back in barbarism, began to exact fidelity from the wife under savage penalties. but he claimed exemption for himself. Of course, they wanted to be absolutely guaranteed that the children this woman produces are my offspring. If he went around and had sex with other women and, children, and had children, it didn't matter that he wanted to make sure that the ones in his house were his offspring who would then inherit the wealth. The ex extreme examples is ancient Greek society. Women were not allowed to see anybody outside the family. Women were literally reduced to children-bearing creatures. This is where the origins of this kind of family are to be found. There is a quote I wanted. This, this I want to read out. When the fact is accepted that the family has passed through four successive forms and is now in a fifth, the question at once arises whether this form can be permanent in the future. The only answer that can be given is that it must advance as society advances and change as society changes, even as it has done in the past. It is the culture of the social system, and it will reflect its culture. As the monogamian family has improved greatly since the commencement of civilization, and very sensibly in modern times, it is at least supposable that it is capable of still further improvement until the equality of the sexes is attained. Should the monogamian family in the distant future fail to answer the requirements of society, assuming the continuous progress of civilization, it is impossible to predict the nature of its successor. These are quite revolutionary ideas, considering it was the 19th century. And what he said about wealth, the human mind stands bewildered in the presence of its own creation. What creation is he referring to? He's referring to property and wealth. And then I, I will bring the last quote from Morgan. A mere property career is not the final destiny of mankind if progress is to be the law of the future as it has been of the past. The time which has passed away since civilization began is but a fragment of the past duration of man's existence, and but a fragment of the ages yet to come. The dissolution of society bids fair to become the termination of a career of which property is the end and aim. Because such a career, 
contains the elements of self-destruction. Now, when, when some people say, oh, Morgan was a racist because of his approach to the early forms of society, well, listen to this. Now, I, I didn't know him personally. I, he was not a friend of mine. <laughs> I don't know what inclinations he may have expressed. But listen to what he says here. Democracy in government, brotherhood in society, equality in rights and privileges, and universal education foreshadow the next higher plane of society to which experience, intelligence, and knowledge are steadily tending, it will be a revival in a higher form of the liberty, equality, and fraternity of the ancient gentes, the gens. So we actually see something positive in the early societies. Now, of course, Morgan was a man of his period. He thought that the United States was the most democratic form of uh, society you could imagine. But you can see why Marx and Engels would have found this extremely interesting. Now, there are objections to this theory. Uh, there's an objection to an evolutionary approach to the development of society. It's described as being ethnocentric. I suppose you, today you might call it Eurocentric. Now, in the 19th century, you'd have to say there's an element of truth in this. Europeans then tended to see other societies through the lenses of European society. Imperialism, colonialism, sought to justify its brutal exploitation of peoples in the colonies. See slavery, for example. This crime carried out against um, Africans, mainly. The idea was developed that they weren't really human. That's why you could exploit them like animals. The other peoples, of course, were inferior and needed the civilization of the Europeans. Well, Jorge Martin yesterday described how they civilized the Americas so-called civilized, the wonders of civilization. But um, to throw out the essential idea of social evolution because it came from the 19th century would be a little bit like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Do we reject Hegel because he was an idealist? No, we don't. What we do is we take the dialectic of Hegel or at least that's what Marx and Engels did. We remove the idealism. And this is the case with many of the discoveries um, as capitalism started to emerge in its early days. You don't throw out everything. In science, we see how science moves upwards to greater and greater understanding. And in each step, obviously, you have to reject certain ideas of the previous period. But you don't reject the kernel, the essence, the, 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 the ideas that are valid. Now, anthropology in the 19th century was dominated by this thinking. Their idea was that society evolves. And as a log the logical consequence is the family also evolves. Now, it's more or less since the 1920s that anthropology did an about turn on this and rejected the ideas of Morgan rejected social evolution. Now, one of the reasons, or the, the fundamental reason I would say they reject Morgan is because he provided the, the ideas, the studies, the data, upon which Engels then developed his text. Morgan became connected with communism. Uh, remember, this was, this was the time when Darwin was developing his theory of evolution. But I find interesting, I found, uh, Steve, uh, an article by Stephen Jay Gould, and it was um, it was on the question of uh, what came first, the erect posture, then the brain, then the hands. Uh, what you know, what came first? Well, the erect posture came first, but uh, the evidence isn't there that that the brain then began to grow for some unknown reason, and when the brain reached a certain size, then men became more intelligent and could do more things. Engels pointed out it was the other way around. See, erect posture frees the hands, and it's through labor that the brain developed. And uh, Engels wrote a text, the part played by labor in the transition from ape to human. 
Stephen Jay Gould says this, quote number 20, the 19th century produced a brilliant expose that will no doubt surprise most readers. Friedrich Engels, he added, um, unfortunately, had no visible impact upon Western science. Note, he says, unfortunately, because on this, Engels was proved correct. Now, I'm not going to go into the quotes because of lack of time. What he, what he basically says, he, he, quotes, he quotes Engels, where Engels explains how idealism dominated philosophy for centuries. But then he says, the importance of Engels' essay lies in his perceptive analysis of the political role of science and the social biases that must affect all thought. This is Stephen Jay Gould. If we took Engels' message to heart and recognized our belief in the inherent superiority of pure research for what it is, namely social prejudice, then we might forge among scientists the union between theory and practice that a world teetering dangerously near the brink so desperately needs. Now, you see, anthropology is a study of human society in its evolution or, its, or, in, or in its variations. As we live in society, we also have prejudices within this society, as Gould points out. But we have to understand that the prejudices that dominate society are the prejudices of the ruling class. The dominant ideas, as Engels explained, are the ideas of the ruling class. That, by the way, explains why the approach to science to study in the past was one, and now it has changed. In the past, the bourgeoisie looked forward to progress. Now it is desperately trying to keep society stable in a society where they are the privileged elite. The only way of breaking with these prejudices is to have a materialist, a materialist and a dialectical approach, concretely a revolutionary approach. Now, some people try and make out that Engels developed dialectics differently from Marx. But, the, you know, The Origin of the Family is a book that Marx intended to write. Between 1879 and 1882, Marx read all the most advanced anthropologists of the period. You can find it on the internet. They're called, uh, he, he left notes. They're called the ethnographical notebooks. Um, Engels after the death of Marx, used those notes and elaborated the, the, the origins of the family, etc. But of course, Engels went beyond Morgan, far beyond. Um, he developed the perspective of how the future societies will change. But you see, today we have this approach, which is to look at the part, i.e., in anthropology, they study in detail this community, that society, this tribe, whatever, very detailed studies. So they look at many parts, but they don't see the whole. Because if you look at the whole, you get a picture. You get a picture of evolution, of change. But the final conclusion you can draw from this bigger picture is that capitalism is not the final stage of human development. And therefore, the family, as we have known it, is not the final form of of the family. Now, Engels explained, he says, human labor power at this stage yielded no noticeable surplus as yet over the cost of its maintenance. What does that mean? Well, you see, when pr productivity of human labor is barely enough to feed yourself and your offspring, there's no material base for the division of society into classes. For me to exploit one of you, you would have to be able to produce at least enough for both of us. That took thousands, tens of thousands of years for productivity to rise above the very primitive level. But once it did reach a certain level, that surplus that was possible created the material base for the division of society. And that is what determined in the end the, what Engels referred to the overthrow of mother right, 
was the world historical defeat of the female sex. The man took command in the home also. The woman was degraded and reduced to servitude. She became the slave of his lust and a mere instrument for the production of children. But Engels also points out that by abolishing private property and bringing everything back into common ownership, then the single family ceases to be the economic unit of society. Engels, Engels referred to, uh, he used the term sex love. What he means by that is um, normal, healthy, natural attraction between people, not marriage based on need or property. And in bourgeois society, most marriages amongst bourgeois are based on massive wealth. But Engels also explained that it was modern large-scale industry which laid the basis for the emancipation of women. Um, he also says, he says, private housekeeping is transformed into a social industry. The care and education of the children becomes a public affair. Society looks after all children alike, whether they are legitimate or not. He refers to the future generations and he says, they will care precious little what anybody today thinks they ought to do. I won't read the rest of it. Basically, he says, it's not, we cannot dictate to the future generations. Now, these were the ideas which the communist movement was based on when it came to the family, women's liberation, etc. Now, I'm convinced that this, the, 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 the shift in anthropology in the 1920s, it's not by chance that it happens in the 20s. Um, in October 1918, when the Bolsheviks came to power, they introduced the code on, on marriage, the family, and guardianship. It was the most advanced marriage uh, law that had ever been seen. Total equality between the sexes. Divorce. You didn't have to have grounds for divorce. You just had to express the desire that you wanted to divorce. The concept of illegitimate child was removed. No such thing as illegitimacy. Abortion was granted. They developed the idea of communal dining rooms, public laundries, childcare centers. They basically tried to carry out a policy on the family based on the ideas of Engels that were in turn based on the findings of Morgan. Unfortunately, of course, the Soviet Union was isolated. The revolution degenerated. I can't go into the details of that. In referring to um, the canteens and the etc. Lenin said in 1919 in a speech, he says, there is an insignificant number of them and the conditions now obtaining in the Soviet Republic, the war and food situation hinder us in this work. Um, they were not able to push forward on that program. Trotsky explained that the worker state had to become wealthier. They had to accumulate more resources. For the first time, we saw in a country, a, a party, the Bolshevik party, attempting to act on the theory of the Marxists on the family. Put yourself in the shoes of the bourgeois in the 1920s. Revolution after revolution, the Russian, the German, the Italian, and many others, they were terrified. Therefore, not only did they have to launch a military offensive against the Soviet Union in an attempt to destroy it, they also had to launch an ideological offensive against the ideas upon which the revolution was based. I want to quote from a book called The Rise of Anthropological Theory. It was written by M. Harris. He says this, with Morgan's scheme incorporated into communist doctrine, the struggling science of anthropology cross the threshold of the 20th century with a clear mandate for its own survival and well-being, expose Morgan's scheme and destroy the method on which it was based. Then began all the studies to disprove that there was uh, matrilineal, that, that, not that there wasn't, that it wasn't a general historical pattern, i.e. from matrilineal through to patrilineal. In another book, 
called Early Human Kinship from Sex to Social Reproduction. We find a quote from Malinowski, who was a Polish anthropologist. I won't read the whole thing, but just one key sentence in a radio broadcast that he made. Well, two sentences, actually. He says, I believe that the most disruptive element in the modern revolutionary tendencies is the idea that parenthood can be made collective. If once we come to the point of doing away with the individual family as the pivotal element of our society, we should be faced with a social catastrophe compared with which the political upheaval of the French Revolution and the economic changes of Bolshevism are insignificant. Therefore, it was an ideological necessity of the bourgeois to combat this idea of social evolution, that the family evolves, and that you can have a different form coming into being. Now, um, that is still present today. The difference today is they move to the stage where basically the idea is there's no pattern. There's no evolution from one form to another. The different forms that we see are simply cultural, i.e. you must eliminate the idea that things can change in a progressive manner as society progresses. And therefore, we're left with a society where men are sexist by nature, men dominate women because of their nature. Well, if that's the case, the perspective is not one of changing society in a progressive manner, but a permanent war of the sexes. That's ideal for the bourgeois, of course, because it foments division. It's in the interests of men, of women. I don't have time here to go into, the, in, into LGBT, uh, et cetera, and other genders. Maybe in the concluding remarks, I can say something on that. But oppression in all its forms, which stems from the idea of property, that's where it originated from. And the, and the, and the archaic family, the patriarchal family, which actually has already started to break down. Capitalism is breaking down the family. We don't have the old days where you had mom, dad, and the kids, and everybody had an uncle and an aunt who were married, and there was no divorced aunt or you know your, your sister with your father who's married to somebody, the way things are developing now. We can actually see elements of the new society emerging within the old, but we still live under capitalism. Capitalism still produces phenomena such as what we saw recently in the United States, the richest capitalist country in the world, and they've just abolished abortion. Think about it, Russia in 1920 was one of the most backward countries, and they introduced abortion. We have many countries where abortion is banned. We still have a huge difference in wage levels between men and women. In Britain, on average, a woman earns 90 pence for every pound a man earns. During the recession, it was more likely a woman would lose her job than a man. During, during the, not, not the recession, during the pandemic. We have a vision of a new society, a society where human beings relate to each other freely, not through economic coercion and not through physical coercion. But we have that vision that Engels developed of the future society. Genuine human relations will emerge once the root cause has been eliminated, the private property that exists under capitalism. How they will relate to each other in the future, that's not up to us to decide. I can't imagine, or I can't even, I can't leave a will telling my future grandchildren how they should relate to each other. The advantage is my, if I have them, if I have grandchildren, they will have over me, is that they will be alive and I'll be dead. <laughs> and there's not much you can do when you're dead. But as I have to finish, I have so much more I'd like to say. As we are alive now, and we live under a historical crisis of capitalism, our task is to build a force to overthrow this system.
to take the wealth which exists, the immense wealth which has been accumulated, use it collectively to have childcare for everybody, to allow a woman or a man to take six months, a year or two years, whatever it is out to have their child, come back to work and have the childcare in place, have enough public housing that if a couple separates, they don't have to fight over who gets the house. There'll be plenty of housing for the husband, for the wife. That means we would remove all the material constraints and provide the material base upon finally human beings being able to relate to, other, to each other freely. And not just men and women, but gays, lesbians, bisexuals, trans, to live with whoever they wish, as they wish. It will take a huge effort to remove all this consciousness accumulated, accumulated over thousands of years. But it can only start if we change the economic base. Now, I have a lot more to say, but I have to conclude because of lack of time. And maybe I can come back in the conclusions and other comrades can come in and supplement on other questions. I just hope I've stimulated comrades' interest to read more, to study more, and develop your own understanding of this question. Brilliant, Fred. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'm sure everyone got a lot out of it. As Fred said, you know, the purpose of, of this talk and all the other sessions is for us all to develop our own understanding once we come away from these meetings. Uh, one of the texts uh, that uh, Fred mentioned, The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State, which is the most fundamental text that Marxists should read to understand the family, is uh, a text that we have available on well-read books. So if you don't have it, I would encourage you to, to get it. So the first speaker we have will be Ilva from Sweden. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Fred, for a brilliant lead off. Now, comrades, if we look at the origins of the family, we can clearly see that if we want to get rid of women's oppression, we have to remove all those things that hinder women from participating fully in social production through socializing those chores that are the responsibilities of the family today. And the amount of democratic reforms and rights that have been won for women under capitalism is in itself a proof of this fact, because women have, as Fred explained, to a large degree been drawn into production, earning their own wages, many of them becoming part of the working class and therefore part of the class struggle. And in countries like Sweden, for quite a, um, uh, quite a time, a large part of what used to be uh, part of women's domestic chores were socialized with elder care, daycare, free meals in schools and so on, which is why Sweden has been called the most equal country in the world. Because children growing up in the past decades grew up with both parents working, which together with other factors led to partly changed attitudes now, this shows the potential of what could be done under socialism, but it can never be done fully under capitalism. Welfare is currently under attack in all countries by privatizations and cuts and have been for decades. The main responsibility of the house, uh, for the household still lies uh, with the, the family and therefore in general with women. And capitalism upholds and benefits off of women's oppression in a myriad of different ways. There are many different ways in which capitalists can make money off of uh, sexism and misogyny. And beyond direct economic incentives, as Fred explained, the ruling class has an interest in using oppression and the family to divide the working class. Under capitalism, the family serves as a pillar for bourgeois ideology, for the spreading of misogynistic and homophobic ideas, and conservative ideas in general, and progress for women like the right to abortion and divorce are often betrayed as a threat to traditional family values and very often also to religion, as are gay rights like the right to uh, sex, same-sex marriage. And through this, the ruling class can divide workers. 
by using the family to rally the most conservative layers of the working class and the petty bourgeoisie uh, against other workers. And we see this now uh, in the US with the attack against the right to abortion, which is one of many other attempts to cut across the growing radicalization by dividing workers. So if you look at it concretely, it's very clear like that women's oppression, like all other oppressions, cannot be abolished under capitalism. But then you have the ideas of feminism and uh, other kinds of identity politics, who tend to see the family and oppression as some sort of free floating structures. And they end up with the most absurd conclusions because of their idealist understanding of the world. They think that if you challenge the ideas of patriarchy, you will change the world. And we see this in queer theory, where the idea is simply to challenge or parody, as they would say, the dominating sexual norms ideas, simply living in ways that goes against the idea of a traditional nuclear family is seen as the main way to challenge oppression. That means in their view, simply being gay, or perhaps even being in an open relationship are seen uh, as revolutionary acts in themselves. Now, these ideas of queer theory are not entirely new. We have seen similar ideas before. Many times in history, petty bourgeois bohemians have imagined that their way of life is somehow revolutionary in itself if it provokes the outrage of some conservatives. But the family is not that fixed as an institution as they imagine it to be. It doesn't fall to pieces because same-sex marriage is allowed, for example, nor was women's oppression in any way challenged by hippies practicing free love in the 70s. And as Engels explained, monogamy was only ever enforced upon women and the monogamous family was always accompanied by things like prostitution uh, and infidelity. In reality, many times, those who have imagined themselves to break with bourgeois morality have only romanticized one aspect of it, or they propose methods of struggle that completely misleads young people who desperately want to struggle against oppression into dead ends. But if one actually seriously studies the history of women's oppression in the family, then it's clear that to rid the world of oppression, then we need class struggle, we need a revolution, and we need socialism. To be able to achieve a society where everyone is free to uh, truly love uh, whoever they want to and live their lives without fear of violence or harassment or any remnants of oppression. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much for that, Ilva. So our first speaker now will be Serena from Italy. Well, in the feminist debates and theories on the origin of patriarchy and the women oppression, Marxism in general and Engels in particular are among the uh, favorite targets of criticism and uh, accusations. Recently, I've run into the so-called modern studies on matriarchy, who claim to be the most updated ones, and whose main representative is Heide Göttner Abendroth, a German academic that has collected a lot of information on a series of contemporary residual matriarchal communities all around the world. Well, she accuses Engels of being unilinear because he recognizes progress and development in history, that is a crime for many, as we know. And because, according to her, in Engels' explanation of appropriation by men, this revolution seems to run smoothly without any catastrophe in history. Now, the problem with these petty bourgeois intellectuals is that even if they have read some Marxism, either they haven't understood a word or they consciously distort it in a caricature. While providing a materialistic explanation of the roots of female oppression, Engels' origin of the family is impregnated of dialectics at every comma. But dialectics is a close book for these ladies and gentlemen. 
Engels shows a full grasp of the complexity of the historical development, being able to explain also its contradictory aspects. For instance, when talking about the shift from mother right to patriarchy, Engels talk, talks indeed of revolution, but revolution doesn't, does not necessarily mean that it has to take place overnight. Engels included in his study intermediate stages between the mother right and the monogamian family, like the patriarchal domestic community, and even steps back. For instance, when he explains the role of the barbaric invasions during the crisis of the Roman Empire and of slave society. Here we have the victory or a more backward form of society corresponding to the barbarian stage and the Gentile constitution over a more developed one. The Roman slave society corresponded to the civilized stage and the monogamian family a society that nonetheless was suffering a deep crisis, having reached, its, um, having, uh, reached the limit of the development of productive forces. Engels provides a dialectical description of this process when he says, if the barbarians recast the ancient form of monogamy, moderated the supremacy of the men in the family, and gave the women a higher position that the classical world had never had ever known, what made them capable of doing so if not their barbarism, their Gentile customs, their living heritage from the time of mother right? But there is not the slightest hint of sentimentalist or moralism by Engels toward this partial revival of the Gentile constitution by the barbarians. Always a scientific dialectical point of view. Here we have a striking example of the dialectical law or the negation of the negation, where the rational kernel of something that has been denied reemerges in a subsequent negation. In fact, the barbaric invasions were a step back in terms of development of the productive forces, but nevertheless, Engels said they infused a vigorous and creative life that was able to rejuvenate the world in the throes of a collapsing civilization. Now, how this can be considered unilinear remains a mystery, according to me. The dialectics show the directions of processes through their inner contradictions, while uh, Abendroth theory seems quite unilinear. She said that private property was introduced after matriarchy was destroyed, when Eastern migrant peoples around four, uh, 5,000 years ago, um, before Christ, sorry, uh, migrate uh, due to climate changes and dissolve their matriarchal structures in their fight for survival with other communities. And there, the, there was the invention of war, violence, private property classes, and so on. Now, these theories have zero evidences. Ironically, the only archaeological study that is brought to support by the Lithuanian archaeologist Maria Gimbutas that studied the, the, the female statues, is at the same time criticized for unfortunately, and I quote, embracing a critically Engels theory. So this is a theory that says that history is moved by material scarcity that cause violence. And this is unilinear because it applies to all the, uh, the history until the present epoch, as the productive forces have never developed since the ancient, ancient times, going to the concrete demands against patriarchy. What, what the, does she say? Create small human coalitions that could destroy superstructures from below. In a model of more simple life, small communities, mutual care and assistance, with a strong ethical sense, and the contemporary matriarchal cultures providing suggestions for the future. So it's not the case that she gets from these contemporary communities indications about, the, about past societies that would have been useful, actually. On the contrary, she considers them as a model for the future. This is pure reactionary utopia. Another example of the, of the idealistic view of petty bourgeois feminists, also when it pretends to be scientific. We Marxists, on the contrary, don't demand, of course, a return to primitive communism, but claim that, given the development that has occurred so far in, history, in the history of humanity, 
By abolishing the very origin of oppression, the private property, and so the class division of society, humanity could once again live without female oppression, but on a much higher level of expression of its potential in a socialist society, uh, also in the field of uh, uh, genuine, authentic human relationships. Thank you. Thank you for that, Serena. Um, we're going to go straight now to Jules, uh, Jules from France. Uh, when I joined uh, university uh, a few years ago, uh, one book was very popular on the left. Uh, it was a criticism of Engels' uh, Origin of the Family by a man named uh, Darmanja. Uh, his main idea seemed simple. Engels' book is old. Let's see if it's still coherent with modern archaeology and anthropology. And Darmanja concluded that it was not the case. And he rested his argumentation on some examples of untergatherer societies where oppression of women existed. So he concluded that since there was women oppression in uh, societies without classes, or as he says so, so women's oppression was not linked to the apparition of class structures. And it must have other causes, but uh, it, it didn't explain which ones. And this book, in fact, was even more popular on the left because Darmanja is not an open anti-communist. He is a self-declared Marxist and a member of uh, Lutourier, the French so-called Trotskyist organization. And his book was uh, used as a weapon against uh, Engels and the Marxist position on this question by anarchists, feminists, uh, all uh, the anti-Marxists in universities in France. And we still defended Engels' views, and we were right, because in fact, uh, the work of Darmanja was not as solid as it seemed. In a typical academic way, he adopted an empiricist approach uh, listing examples of untergatherer society with women oppression, but uh, without any reflection on the sources of these observations or on the, even the validity of these examples. For instance, he used a uh, 19th century uh, Aborigines of Australia as an example of untergatherer society with women's oppression, but he forget to take into account uh, the fact that these same communities were subjected to a genocidal conquest, that they were at, the, at that precise time uh, pushed to the deserts and submitted uh, to an uh, evangelical onslaught by Christian missionaries. All things that pushed in the towards the development of women's oppression were or might have pushed. And in fact, there were issues with almost all of the examples uh, uses, which unfortunately I don't have the time to deal with. And there was also other problems. As uh, Serena mentioned, he too uh, didn't clearly understood ideas of uh, Engels. He tended to present it, to present uh, Engels as a kind of mechanistic evolutionist. Uh, he even had produced uh, weird uh, spreadsheets of social and technical evolution. According to him, the uh, ideas of Engels were that if you have discovered one type of invention, then you jumped from one social level to another, something that is completely alien. In fact, uh, 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 an approach so mechanistic that it is completely alien to the ideas of Engels. And also, other, he made other mistakes. He confused uh, matrilinearity with matriarchy. And the final nail in the coffin of his book was even more ironic because his main argument was that modern research disproved Engels. Well, as a matter of fact, modern research disproved Darmanja because since at least the beginning of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s, uh, there had been several researches, several studies confirming the ideas of Engels. And since uh, 10 or 12 years, there had been a new trend in uh, archaeology that tend to stress the egalitarian nature of uh, paleolithic societies. Uh, 
for instance, a French researcher, uh, Marilène Patoumatis, I'm sorry for his so French name, uh, she uses archaeological data from prehistoric sites to prove that women were not oppressed before the Neolithic, uh, that she, they had access to the same food and in the same quantities that men, they participated in cave paintings, and some even participated to the hunting of big animals. And she stressed that all this point to an egalitarian uh, relationship between men and women in these societies. But as it is often the case with academic milieu and trends, she falls from one error to another. Uh, having observed a relative equality between sexes, Patumatis concludes that there was at the time an absolute equality, uh, that there was no division of labor whatsoever. And uh, she, she tends to draw an idyllic picture of intergather societies, which she even describes as societies of abundance. And she explains that our view of prehistory have been falsified by the idea of progress. And in fact, in a clear case of uh, postmodern relativism, she tends to reduce this question to representations and values and uh, argues that these societies were at all level better than the one who succeeded them. She even go as far as to deny the existence of violence at the time. And it is something that is uh, disproven by archeology. span And that is something that Darmanja himself had been very happy to stress against her because he was right for once. Because you found numerous acts of violence and traces of violence between humans in the Paleolithic societies. I, I won't uh, go into details of uh, prehistoric site, but it is something that is uh, very well known. We found uh, bodies with uh, projectiles still lodged into the bones dating from the Paleolithic uh, times. And these violence were caused by the simple fact that is a lack of resources pushing groups to compete. Because as Fred said, these societies were unable to produce a surplus. And so they were very uh, fragile. But why uh, do we bother on these uh, questions? After all, it is something that is uh, often uh, heard on the heard on uh, universities on, uh, on, the, on the left, uh, why bother with the origin of uh, oppression as we can uh, only uh, fight against it? Because if we don't have a correct comprehension of, the, of these origins, we cannot fight them. And it is clear with these two examples, Darmanja sides with bourgeois liberal. This question is not connected to the class struggle. Patumatis, she argues, for new values and new representations. And she said that by showing that women were powerful in the past, we are fighting oppression. But we say to succeed, the fight for women's liberation must be a part of the struggle against class societies because the two are inextricably linked. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to Marissa from Canada. Um, I want to talk about the demand for wages for housework as an approach to addressing gender inequality and inequality in the family. Uh, the demand has been around for a number of decades, and with the pandemic, there was a renewed call for wages for care work. Uh, with an open letter from the organization of Global Women's Strike calling for a care income, to accompany the gov government payouts to those who lost wages due to COVID. One cannot understand where this demand comes from. Uh, while there has been a dr dramatic upswing in women uh, participating in the workforce since the 1950s, there has not been a commensurate increase in men helping with care work or reproductive labor. This represents a huge burden on women's time and energy, which in turn prevents them from pursuing other goals or interests in life. Uh, notably career goals, which is one justification for why women continue to be paid less than men. Uh, so something needs to be done to even the playing field, right? Okay. Uh, something needs to be done, but not wages for housework. 
uh, first of all, Marxists understand that the cost of reproductive labor is generally on average over time um, included in wages. Uh, the price of labor power includes the cost of reproducing it. The fact that this isn't paid directly to the person doing the care work doesn't mean that it's unpaid. Still, one could argue that this money should be paid directly to uh, the person doing the care work, the housewife, instead of to the breadwinner, since financial dependence is a huge source of inequality. Uh, but this is still an incorrect demand, even a reactionary demand. Um, the foundation of the oppression of women in the family is not simply just financial dependence. Um, part of the shift to private property saw the family and the home getting siloed off from public life. In pre-class societies, as Morgan describes, the family was the form of social organization. There was no divide between public life and family life. Uh, children were cared for in common, meals prepared in common in, instead of in private, and, and decisions were made in common. Uh, the rise of private property and the move towards monogamous families cut women off from economic power, and it also cut women off from public life. Uh, now life was divided into the public sphere, work, trade, politics, and the private sphere, the family home. The laws that uh, eventually barred women from things like running for office you know, reinforced this. Um, or like Fred mentioned, um, in ancient Greece, for example, women were not allowed outside the home to see anyone outside the family. Well, laws like that might not exist anymore, but the bourgeois family is still incredibly isolating as a structure. Uh, think of a suburban housewife alone in a house with only a, a child for company uh, that has an impact on mental health. Uh, there may not be laws that keep the woman the woman in the home, but the burden of housework keeps women there anyways. And uh, that isolation makes women and children even more vulnerable to violence in the home. Um, one of the justifications for the demand for waged housework that you hear a lot is uh, that housework isn't valued enough by our society. Um, that's the reason why it's unpaid. That's why men don't want to do it because it's low status because we as a society don't assign enough value to it and paying wages for housework work would remedy this. Uh, but that gets things backwards. I mean, there's a material reason for housework to be offloaded onto the private sphere so that it costs the capitalists as little as possible. Uh, that's why it's low status, not the other way around. And you can see how that plays out economically. Um, in the book, The Second Shift by Arlie Russell Hostchild, uh, the author spent time with and did in-depth interviews with a number of couples from all different backgrounds. And one thing she found was that no matter what the initial intentions of the couples were, the burden of housework ended up falling on the woman, woman. Um, except in one case where the woman actually left her husband over the issue. Um, and there were some cultural factors that played into this, of course. But what was really important was the fact that the men made more money or had more career opportunities. So it made more sense economically for the women to do more housework. Um, even if the couple initially thought that they wouldn't let that get in the way, the economic reality asserted itself. The ideas in the, of individuals were not decisive. Wages for housework would only provide more incentive for women to stay in the home, to take themselves out of the workforce, and in doing so, remove themselves from public life. It's a step backwards. Engels wrote that one of the progressive things about capitalism was that it pushed women into the workforce. That is, uh, it made women active members of the class that has the power to run society instead of, instead of just adjuncts to it. Uh, this lays the basis for the true equality of women. Um, and the solution to the problem of housework is not to simply assign more value to it, either ideologically or with money, but to bring it out of the home with public childcare, laundries, cafeterias, uh, to shatter the old division between public and private spheres that kept women imprisoned. Um, we don't know what the family will look like in the future under socialism, uh, but we know that it won't be isolated from the rest of society. Thank you, Marissa. Um, we'll move now to our final speaker, which will be Karen, uh, our final intervention before Fred, which will be Karen from Mexico. Uh, well, in the broad uh, movement of uh, women in Latin America, which uh, has been uh, very active in the later period, feminist groups uh, have uh, been at the vanguard and they uh, infused their Confucian ideology uh, through uh, the whole movement. 
Uh, among the great uh, diversity of feminism, uh, there is a particular one I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, the decolonial uh, feminism. Uh, this kind of uh, feminism stands uh, that it is necessary to purge uh, feminism and uh, the struggle for women's emancipation from the Eurocentric influence uh, of white feminism and, of course, also from Marxism. Nevertheless, um, these uh, discrepancies uh, between uh, different feminisms will help us to demonstrate uh, the Marxist standpoint uh, that uh, the origin of the oppression of women is framed within class divided societies and not in the southern version of patriarchy. Among the exponents of uh, the colonial feminism, uh, we, can, we can find uh, Maria Lugones and uh, Ojeronki, uh, who are said, um, and, and they say, uh, the no existence of a patriarchy and a gender system in the time prior to conquest and colonization. Arlette uh, Gutierrez says, uh, colonization brought uh, with uh, it a radical loss of women's political power when it existed. And uh, finally, to end with this uh, series of uh, quotations, uh, Rita Segato uh, comments about this uh, the colonial variant that it identifies in the indigenous and Afro-American societies a patriarchal organization, even if it's different from the Western brand, uh, but it may be described as a, a low intensity patriarchy. In the face of these standpoints, uh, the general approach of uh, the colonial feminism practically is uh, that uh, there uh, didn't exist any oppression of women in pre-Hispanic societies or it existed, but it was uh, with a low intensity. Uh, therefore, it was uh, the Europeans uh, who brought oppression and male domination of women, and they call it a uh, patriarchy, and thus uh, uh, it is necessary to get rid of colonial heritage. And Eurocentrism uh, to emancipate indigenous and black women in the colonial uh, countries. So I will go on uh, in making a brief analysis of uh, family formations and the role of women in the Mexica society um, from the standpoint of uh, historic materialism. In this way, uh, we can confirm if the oppression of women in colonized countries is a heritage of the coloni uh, colonization process or uh, whether the Marxist standpoint, despite it is, uh, its uh, Eurocentric character, of course, uh, comes uh, with uh, its materialist uh, analysis of the development of the productive forces with the accumulation uh, process and the differences between the caste, the caste of pre-Hispanic societies. The Aztec Empire spreads throughout um, uh, Mesoamerica uh, from the military subjugation and, extra, uh, and the extraction of surplus value from the collection of taxes of other peoples. Its uh, main unit of uh, production was the agriculture commune that uh, paid a tribute to a state uh, dominated by a privileged caste of nobles, warriors, and priests. In this uh, deeply uh, militarized uh, society, there was an exaltation of masculine values, which were even reflected in their religious, uh, religious beliefs, since human uh, creation was uh, associated with a uh, a masculine god, the war god, by the way. Meanwhile, uh, disasters and calamities uh, were associated with a fem uh, female uh, goddesses. In the Mexica society, uh, there were a political, economic, and a social difference between the noble caste and the tributary people. And this was also seen in the family relationships that occur in each stratum. The role of noble family was to create political lineage ties since it was uh, the sons uh, who inherited the social, political, and economic privileges. While the daughters will have to uh, role, uh, will have the role of uh, creating a profitable uh, marriage ties to maintain the uh, lineages or for military or a commercial alliance. Uh, the families of the people uh, constitute uh, the economic uh, unit of production and also in the tax system. Uh, the families uh, live in autonomous uh, uh, communal lands 
where a marriage between a members of the same community were preferred in order to preserve a, the social group established there. Although a private property it did not exist in pre-Columbian societies, the in inheritance of the social position and privilege of the dominant caste played a very important role in the subjugation of the Mexica women. Within the social order of the Mexicas, eh, there were a very strict eh, moral and legal eh, codes for women. They could eh, not reach a public or priestly eh, positions. They could not be a eh, polygamous. Eh, also, a eh, pre-marital chastity and fidelity were required. Otherwise, eh, they could be stoned or eh, punished to death. Also, the Mexica uh, women were educated to be good women. Uh, they had uh, to know uh, how to wave, uh, till the land, uh, cook, uh, take care of their children, to be uh, respectful of their husband, uh, quiet and helpful. So, as we can see, uh, the family conditions and oppression of women in pre-Hispanic uh, societies were not very different uh, from uh, those experienced by women in other parts of the world. So it is clear that the patriarchal rule is not an European uh, heritage. This is a direct consequence of the forms of production uh, developed in the different civilizations. In Europe, uh, it was the appropriation of a uh, private property, the initial form of exploitation, and the submission of women to male control. Uh, but in the case of the pre-Hispanic societies, there was no uh, private property, but there was a privileged caste uh, that uh, benefited from the exploitation of other peoples and required the uh, oppression of women uh, to maintain their status and society. So uh, this is how we can conclude that Engels' analysis of the oppression of women is perfectly applicable to the reality of Latin America and colonized countries. And uh, that there are no shortcuts. Uh, the only way to emancipate uh, the oppressed uh, women of the world is by the class struggle, not decolonizing the language or canceling everything from Europe. Instead, we have to rise the struggle for socialism for the full emancipation of humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karen, and thank you to all the other people who've contributed. And now I'll be um, taking us back to uh, Fred, who's gonna reply to the discussion for 30 minutes or 25, hopefully. Thank you, Fred. Well, to be honest, a session like this really required a whole day, and even that wouldn't be enough. Comrades have intervened on, on questions which merit discussions in and of themselves. But we can develop this, I'm sure, with comrades writing articles with the material they brought to this uh, session. I'll start with the last intervention by Karen. She explained that the patriarchal uh, society didn't come from Europe. Of course, the society that came from Europe was patriarchal, but you already had patriarchal societies in the Americas. But even if it were the case, let's say, you want to get rid of the colonial heritage. Was it just patriarchal relations that the Europeans brought? Uh, they brought a particular form of class society. So if you really want to abolish the heritage, you should abolish private property and classes. Because if you don't do that in the, in the Americas, patriarchal relations will continue. You can't separate the two. Something else that has come up, this idea that if you are an alternative, you dress in a certain way, you use certain words, you express yourself in a certain way, that makes you revolutionary. But if you are binary or cis or all the other words, then you are reactionary. I see it a different way. If you struggle for the expropriation of the capitalist class, then you are revolutionary. If you express yourself in an alternative manner, but you support the market economy and capitalism, you are a reactionary, no matter how alternative you may look. We have to say this clearly. If you adhere to any form of politics, which involves atomizing the working class, 
breaking it up into a myriad of identities, then you are a reactionary. I'm sorry. That is a fact. No matter how alternative you can be on other questions, at the end of the day, all forms of oppression are an expression of class society. And it's only the working class organized as a force that can change society. Now, you see the, the impact of material changes on consciousness. It, it's not so long ago that divorce was looked down on as something bad, something terrible, something immoral. Or for a woman to have a baby without a husband was regarded as the utmost immorality. For young people to have sex before getting married was considered the worst abomination. Although I have pretty concrete evidence proof that practically all my uncles and aunts had sex before marriage. Unfortunately, then they had to get married and stick with the man for the next 60 or 70 years. But you can see already, even before capitalism is overthrown, at least in the advanced capitalist countries, but even beyond, attitudes have changed. Well, there's a material base to it. Urbanization, women going into work, education for boys and girls, women coming out of the home and going into work and becoming part of the movement of the working class. So there's a material base to these changes, even before the overthrow of capitalism. The talk of, uh, where there's some talk of socialization of the chores. You know, when I was a little boy, I used to hear my mother singing from the bathroom. She wasn't having a shower. She was washing the sheets by hand in the bathtub, bent over the tub. As a young woman, she washed the clothes by the river, carrying everything on her head in a basket. I think the biggest liberation in her life is when I bought her her first washing machine. Technology actually is part of the process. Dishwashers, hoovers, many other uh, such um, devices. But socialization means also efficient, um, good quality childcare. It means reduction of the working day, having a, a, a more, let's put it, a more human balance between the amount of time you dedicate to work and the amount of time, therefore, you're free for your family. It means guaranteeing an income to a family when it has children. It means guaranteeing the parents who have the children a return into the workplace. How many women have to give up the idea of doing the job they would always wanted to do because they have the kids? It doesn't have to be that way. As I said, the Bolsheviks tried to implement a communist program on the family. If you read uh, some of Kollontai's articles, although she was a utopian, she was announcing the, the, the great victories, the great changes. 85% of, 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 the, of the population of the Soviet Union were peasants. Hardly anything changed for them. And the fact that the Soviet Union was so backward in terms of productive forces meant that they could not advance with that program. The rise of Stalinism is an expression of that backwardness. The Bolsheviks decriminalized homosexuality. The Stalinists criminalized homosexuality. The Bolsheviks introduced abortion. The Stalinists abolished it. The Bolsheviks made divorce an easy matter. The Stalinists made it more difficult. You just have to read the history, it's all there. This flows from the isolation of the revolution in one backward country. Uh, different comrades have talked about um, uh, you know, earlier societies and the, the evidence for matrilineal uh, heritage. But the evidence keeps popping up. You know, you have this article, that article. Oh, we found this evidence for matri matrilineal or, or, pa or, or this or that. Here I have an article on hunter-gatherers. Hunter-gatherer societies are typically egalitarian. They do not tend to have an overall leader. The person taking the lead at any given time might depend on their skills at task in hand. Men and women tend to have different roles, but are valued equally and all help in the daily task of finding food.
and I, I, I can't quote all of them. I have many different articles, uh, some very detailed about um, the, the collective nature of hunter-gatherers. One of the problems when they tried to negate what Engels and previously Morgan said, I found in this article, it's in the New Yorker in 2019, the, the actual title is How Cultural Anthropologists Rede Redefined Humanity. But it makes the point, and I quote, even in the 1920s, it was almost impossible to find groups of humans untouched by Western practices. And for example, it quotes the fact that in Samoa, they were already all Christians. As soon as there's contact with capitalism, family relations start to change. So they have to be a lot more careful in the societies they're actually looking at. Um, Jules made the point about how even Mar so-called Marxists have abandoned Engels. Well, this is a hundred years of pressure in the academic world. It's so-called public opinion, the dominant opinion. Well, if you, if you make concessions to the dominant opinion of this nature, you're making a concession to bourgeois opinion. At the same time, the communists have made the point, we shouldn't idealize early societies. Because the communism, for instance, that Morgan referred to was within the community, within that particular community. But there were wars with other groups over territory, over the right to hunt in a particular area. There's a material basis to it. The thing about today is capitalism has developed the productive forces as far as it could. Now it's actually in the process of destroying productive forces. Just look at the Ukraine. But immensely powerful productive forces are coming to being. We could create a society where everybody's basic material needs are met. Food, housing, clothing, good quality housing, in harmony with the environment. We could produce in a more harmonious way without reducing um, the standard of living of people. Reducing the working day for everybody, and in effect, extending the time that people dedicate to learning and raising their own cultural level. That is possible. But the productive forces have to be freed from the shackles of private property. And by removing those shackles, changing the conditions, then consciousness will change as a consequence. Why was the consciousness of, say, the Europeans who arrived in North America and that of the indigenous peoples they met, why was the consciousness on the question of property so different? I remember reading, I can't remember where I read it, years ago. It described the chief of an indigenous tribe who saw some Europeans building a fence around a piece of land. What, he actually said, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're building a fence around our land. And he said, how can you, how can the land belong to you? We belong to the land. Now that's two different consciences, if you think of it, of the, on the question of property. It was because it was a different structure to society. Therefore, as Marxists, we understand if we change the relations of production, if we change the the, the, the property relations, if we bring property back as common ownership, but not the property of a stone axe, but the property of tractors, combine harvesters, robots, the advanced technology which is available, we could actually continue to increase the productivity of labor to unheard of levels. The, the, the culture, let's say, of the ancient Greeks and Romans was based on what? The slaves, the work of the slaves. They produced the food. They produced what the thinkers needed. The future society will be based on a different kind of slave, on advanced technology and machines, which will reduce the amount of human labor necessary to produce what we need to an incredible degree. In that kind of society, what will be the point of desiring greater accumulation of property? It's incredible, even Morgan understood that it's self-destructive.
That's the kind of society we want to create. But it's not a utopian dream. It's a possibility. It's a real material possibility. But it has to go through the socialist transformation of society. That's our next task. Create a movement, a party with clear ideas. Why do we study history? It's to understand how society moves, how it evolves, how it develops, and how, therefore, it can be changed. And we combine that study with the practical activity of building the Marxist tendency with these ideas. But if you have this vision of the future, it gives greater meaning to the daily activity of the comrades. We have an objective to change society. And it starts by building up the instrument with which to change society. And in the future, the family will be a very different creature. And it's the future generations that will decide what form to give it. But it will definitely be a lot healthier than the one we have today.